Tonight's video is brought to you by The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis, my own podcast. You can listen on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Anchor, Spotify, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you can find audio podcasts. It's a great way to listen to these stories when you're trying to relax, do the dishes, go to sleep, whatever, and not have to worry about having your phone on all night with YouTube or anything like that. Since it's only audio, you can have your phone locked and just have your headphones on and relax. It's something that I really want to grow this year. So if it sounds like something you'd be interested in or something you want to try out, head over there and check it out. All the links to it will be in the description below. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening. Ouroboros by Matt Demersky. There are some things in this life you simply can't do anything about, but at 11 years old, we didn't know that. When our friend Cody was diagnosed with cancer, we thought for sure we could simply go on an adventure and find some sort of mysterious cure like they always did on television. It was the early 90s back then, and the internet was just beginning to be a thing. We would cluster around the computer and investigate terribly formatted message boards in search of the arcane, because for the first time our reach extended beyond our cul-de-sac and out across the limitless globe to places and peoples unknown. All we knew of these others were basic plain text sentences on a goofy colored background above permanent under construction gifts. Naturally, the first thing we did was agree to meet a stranger in the woods. She claimed to be a cute 13 year old girl with red hair and the three of us were both excited and terrified of investigating the cave she said she'd found. Kyle and I were iffy on climbing in a cave, but Grant and Cody were already psyching each other up to look cool and adventurous in front of a girl. The day was uncomfortably humid among the tall Virginian pines, and I remember nearly turning back as we hiked through banks of mosquitoes on our approach toward the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It couldn't have been more than a few miles from home, but it felt like we'd gone on a dangerous safari. We should have listened to that instinct. Following the landmarks the message on the form had given us, we worked our way deeper into tangled undergrowth across fallen logs and further from anything familiar. As children in the 90s, being left to wander the forest on a summer day with our friends was not out of the ordinary, but none of us had ever gone this far. There was absolutely no wind at all as we crunched our way forward and Bird song was the only other sound. When even that stopped, absolute silence fell. We had reached our destination. In soundless humidity under clouded sunlight, a large boulder formed a mossy dome in the middle of a clearing. Nothing grew around it, and the blackened earth held a pattern of serration like the back of some rigid serpent that had somehow wrapped itself around the base of the ancient stone. We saw these things and would certainly have been concerned if not for the presence of a red-haired girl a bit older than us sitting on top of the rock. She lowered her water bottle and said, Good, you're here. Let's go. Our relief that she was actually who she said she was made us realize that we might have found someone out here and suddenly wary... We asked, uh, where? When she humped down, we saw that she was a tomboyish girl with a plain face, not at all the young Cindy Crawford that Grant and Cody had been hoping for. Still, we'd come all this way, and a girl two years older than us was still intimidating. When she insisted, under this rock, we dutifully followed her around to the other side of the stone dome to find a recently made hole and a banged-up shovel. The black pattern on the ground dives under the rock here, she said. So I dug at it to see what I could find. It turns out there's a whole cave under there. Kyle had concerns about the safety of the cave, concerns that I shared, but the girl insisted it was safe. 
She pulled a flashlight from her pocket and pointed it within, showing us that there were man-made walls below. One by one, we followed her into the hole under that massive capping rock, and we brought out our own flashlights to look around. The walls were not the color of earth. Huge gray bricks as long as a person and as tall as Grant held up the tunnel around us, conveying the feeling of a very old temple. Small alcoves held inscribed images at intervals, but the carvings were all that remained. Any color they'd once had had long since fallen away. Corey had the idea to angle the flashlights to emphasize the shallow carvings, but the shadows that emerged painted only pictures of a world of darkness and despair. Small human figures held their arms up as they ran or were eaten by a massive snake-like creature with huge fanged mouths. Is this Native American? Grant asked. The girl shook her head. No way. We have tons of their caves near my house. This is something else. It looks way older. Kyle backed toward the spear of light from the hole to the surface, but he didn't flee just yet. What's older? What was here before the Native Americans? I don't know, she said, unafraid. That's why we're looking around. <laughs> Aren't you curious? He swallowed his unhappiness and continued on with us down the tunnel. The wall took us deeper and deeper into darkness until the light from the hole curved out of sight. With our five flashlights, we were not too concerned, but I did begin swinging my beam back behind us at intervals. What I thought had been complete silence now crept upon me like a distant whispering, or perhaps a small breeze curling eddies unseen in the dust. Were the shadows themselves watching us and muttering amongst themselves? And it was warmer here than it should have been. I'd been in caves before, and they were usually on the unpleasant side of Chile. This temple-like tunnel was a little warm. Before I could figure anything out, we saw a lance of sunlight curve into sight ahead. At first we thought it was another hole, but we soon realized that we were coming up on the entrance again. The tunnel had taken us in a giant loop. By then, the whispering eddies had become more pronounced, and I became absolutely certain I was actually hearing something. This time, when I turned my beam behind us, I nearly screamed. But the older girl grabbed my mouth and pushed Grant and Cody toward the opposite wall and dragged Kyle and me into a carven alcove. For nearly 15 seconds, we clung to warm stone and pressed back as hard as we could. For nearly 15 seconds, we watched a wall of scales slide past our three circles of light just inches away. We could only hope Grant and Cody had gotten the idea and were pressed into the alcove on the other side. Here we barely fit, and Kyle bit his lips so hard that blood began pouring down his chin. He did so to keep from screaming, for he was the outermost of us and those huge shimmering green scales were moving by millimeters from his sleeve. I'd seen massive milky white eyes moving right toward us. The creature was blind, possibly from millennia spent underground moving in an internal circle, but we didn't dare test whether it was deaf as well. One scream but the enormous serpent was suddenly passed like a train departing down the line, and we saw Grant and Cody staring at us with wide eyes of their own from across the tunnel. To go to the exit hall, we had to go the direction the creature had gone. How could we will ourselves to do that? It turned out very slowly. We knew that it would be coming back around the long loop, but our animal fears were far more concerned with the slithering sounds receding just ahead. What would it do if it sensed us? It was almost exactly the size of the tunnel. Could it even turn around? We 
couldn't risk it. Only a few feet ahead, Kyle sighted a deeper alcove that actually became a small tunnel of its own, and we ducked inside in the hopes of timing our escape. Instead, we found an adjoining chamber, and there was no mistaking the cathedral feel of the high vaulted and elegant stonework within. Even stranger, on a platform in the middle of the chamber, rather than set near the back wall like one might expect, a raised stone hand lay upon beneath an ornate fist-sized hadron that seemed to be floating in the air. It was a geometric solid with eight sides, like two pyramids stuck together and covered in delicate carvings. Like the alcoves, it lacked any coloring, but the silvery metal seemed to make the images upon it come alive under our flashlights. We whispered at her harshly to stop, but the girl put her hand on it, and it stopped floating. She turned it this way and that, but it was just an inert hunk of metal and stone, and whatever curious energies it had held had apparently dissipated. No, that wasn't exactly correct. We still felt a strong compulsion to look at it and keep it with us. Collectively enthused by our mysterious treasure, we crept back to the larger tunnel, waited in terror as the giant snake passed again, and then made a run for the tunnel exit. Climbing out of there was probably the most panic-filled moment of my life. At any instant, a tremendous creature under the earth could have sunk blade-like fangs into me, and I would never have seen it coming. But we made it out, and back into the heat and humidity. I'd never been so happy to see mosquitoes again. We ran through clouds of them without a care, for we'd both found treasure and escaped with it. This was everything we'd hoped for. A half mile away from that strange rock and its surrounding tattoo in the earth, I stumbled and nearly fell, and we all slowed to take a break. As we sat, the red-headed girl leaned down and picked up a coin. Hey, look, a 50-cent piece. What, in the dirt out here? Grant asked. She shrugged. It is what it is. That should have been our first warning but it was too small and too early. The girl's name was Morgan, and our discovery meant that she was now locked in as our friend. The five of us had a secret, and that meant we would be seeing quite a bit of each other. Rather than going our separate ways, we finally made it back out to the forest. We decided to delay the question of who would keep the Hedron by faking a sleepover. Cal's parents were rather oblivious, and they did not see Morgan as we snuck her into the basement. We sat in that basement for hours, going over and over the object with magnifying glasses and tracing paper and anything else we could think of that might help us crack the mystery of its meaning and origin. The metal carvings on it portrayed very different scenes from the alcoves. As we rotated it, we saw the story of an unknown human figure at first running from a massive serpent, then turning to face it as it grew smaller and finally chasing it in turn as the snake shrank. The last face of the Hedron showed the man alone, resting from the chase now that the creature had shrunk into oblivion. Someone made this a long time ago, Morgan said, her eyes wide. Probably to fight or control those snake things. Has the snake just been down there all this time? Cody wondered. Going around and around and around? I happened to look out one of the windows to the backyard behind Kyle's basement then, and I froze as I thought I saw a wall of scales moving between the trees out in the darkness. But that wasn't possible, was it? As Cody began coughing, I decided not to say anything. The day had already been pretty stressful for him, and he was not looking well. None of us acknowledged the reality of what was happening to him, but that night, we were collectively more focused on making sure he was comfortable and had the best couch. When we woke up the next morning, Morgan wasn't in the room, and the Hedron was nowhere to be seen. 
For a moment, we panicked, but our mutual exhaustion kept us from doing anything drastic. I was tired in a way I hadn't been before, and it only lifted somewhat as she came jogging back with the artifact in hand. I thought I saw the giant snake, she said warily. I'm not sure, but I might have chased it away with this thing. Kyle gulped. It's just like... loose? Morgan wasn't sure, and I didn't want to speak up just yet to confirm that I'd also seen it. How could something that huge even move around the neighborhood without destroying things or getting noticed? The answer didn't occur to me until we snuck upstairs and ate breakfast after Kyle's parents had gone to work. I said it with Cheerios still in my mouth. It's smaller now. What is? The serpent. It did follow us. I saw it. I turned my head and stared out the window at the bushes moving in the wind. But remember the metal carvings? The serpent gets smaller when it's chasing you. It was finally time to panic. Running up to the second floor together, we peered out the windows until we saw it. A long, winding, scaled body moving behind the neighbor's fence. The snake was now the height of a large dog, but still as long as a backyard. We began screaming then, at least until the snake began curving back toward us. It could hear us. We ran from Kyle's house in a veritable stampede, and this time we had no problem letting someone take the hadron. We foisted it on Morgan and separated, hoping to see who it would follow. It was not directly behind us on the street, but we knew it would find us. It had somehow located us miles from where we'd found it, and it was enormously adept at staying out of sight of everyone but us. On my way home, I didn't look where I was going, and a kid on a bike crashed into me. It was a scary moment, but I brushed it off and staggered home cut up and bruised. The injuries matched how I felt. I only began to really worry when we got on a group phone call and Kyle, Grant, and Cody all began talking about the bad luck they'd had. I'd been hit by a kid on a bike. Kyle had fallen into a sticker bush and gotten scraped all over. Grant had hit his head on a low-hanging door and split open his skin, and Cody said he was feeling worse every minute. But Morgan answered our group call and said, I'm feeling great. And my school's closed tomorrow because of pipe burst. I don't have to go in for a test I didn't study for. Also, I found a $20 bill. We began to suspect. But we didn't know until Grant broke his arm the next day and Cody was taken to the hospital after a sudden turn for the worse. I barely avoided being hit by a car, but became even more cut up and bruised in the process, and Kyle caught a terrible flu that kept him home from school. Something was happening to us. Meanwhile, Morgan's father won the lottery. She met me with excited and happy until she saw my injuries and I told her what was happening to the others. For a moment, she hesitated, and I thought she might decide to keep the artifact, but she shook her head at long last and made the better choice. We rode our bikes to the hospital and smuggled the hedron in with us as we visited Cody. He was awake, but looking pale and gaunt, and we placed it in his hand and waited. After four hours, Morgan still reported feeling great and Cody was looking no better. I was not sure I could stand the draining feeling in my chest much longer either. The energy, I realized. It was floating until you touched it. And then it changed. With a look of slow horror, Morgan realized that simply handing the object to someone else would not stop what was happening. What if we threw it in the ocean? I shook my head. Doesn't seem to matter where it is. 
Cody's holding it, nothing's changed. Her horror slowly morphed into anger. She scowled. Then let's break it. You guys are nice, and I didn't become your friend just to make you all sick. Over on the bed, Cody smiled weakly at her. Thank you. She nodded and took the evil object from him. Together, she and I stepped out into the hallway and immediately leapt away and began running. The snake was a foot high now, but still very long and had infiltrated the hospital. It hissed and slid after us with its milky white eyes searching. We led it away from Cody as best we could. None of the doctors, nurses, or other visitors stirred to action, for the snake expertly dodged their attention. By the time they were looking, it was already out of sight. But all that hiding gave us distance. Morgan and I escaped to the hospital, ran out onto the street, and threw the object in a trash-compacting dumpster out back. We didn't care if we got in trouble. We turned it on and watched as the power of man's machine crushed the contents within to a pulp. We stared as the compactor ground to a halt and began smoking. The metal within had bent and left the hedron completely undamaged. It was warm to the touch, too, as I grabbed it with trepidation and began to lose hope. We couldn't get rid of it. We couldn't destroy it. What could we do? The snake was relentless. No matter where we went, it was close behind, and I was unable to sleep that night for the tension caused by it slithering outside the door in the window. The four of us gathered that day to see Cody. His face had become thin and skull-like, and he looked like a shadow of his former self. To us, he said, Guys, we saw what happens on the walls. The groups of figures only got away because the snake caught one of them, remember? But the Hedrin only has one person on it, Grant insisted. Kyle nodded. Morgan stared at the floor. Cody shook his head feebly. They're all part of the same structure. It's all connected. This won't stop until one of us dies. I grabbed his hand. No! You can't stop it, he continued, his eyes bright despite the darkness wasting away the rest of him. I'm going to take one for the team, so it'll let the rest of you go. No! Yes. The snake was small then, just a slithering little creature the size of a pencil. And we waited in despairing silence as it crept along the plastic tube that led up into his nose. He nodded at us, and then began seizing. Doctors and nurses rushed in, and we were pushed out of the room, but I couldn't see anything. I could only hear the beeps of technology and the urgent voices of professionals at work. Wandering back to the visitor's area with my friends, we sat in a daze. Why me? Morgan asked. Why did it help me and hurt all of you? Grant absently messed with the sling for his broken arm and shook his head. Kyle stared at the wall. I rolled the hedron in my hands. It hadn't even suffered so much as a dent from the trash compactor, but the fact remained that it was just a toy, a bauble, nothing at all, a silly hope, an innocence lost. We four lingered after the funeral. We'd been four before this adventure, and we were four again, but not the same four. One had come and gone. Standing by his grave, I rolled the hedron in my sight, watching the glyphs depict exactly what we'd gone through. As I ran through it over and over and over, I began to realize that this object was a uniform geometric shape. There was really no indication of a beginning or end of the story. We'd only assumed that in our naivety. No. This was a series of images designed to continue seamlessly. It was not a story. 
It was a cycle. The serpent burst forth from Cody's grave once again, the thickness of a hearse throwing earth and gravestones and even pieces of smashed tree out in every direction. We stared in awe as it tore a path through the graveyard and slithered back into the evening darkness. In my hands, the headroom became a painted rock like any other. There are some things in this life that you simply can't do anything about. The Thing That Took My Sister by Brandon Faircloth I had good parents growing up. They loved me and showed it, were usually patient and fair, and I never went hungry or got anything worse than a spanking. That being said, when my sister Kat was around, there wasn't any question that she was the favorite. Part of it was because of her personality. She was lively and always funny and fun, where I tended to read a lot and keep to myself or hang out with my friends more than spending extra time with our parents. No doubt they felt closer to her, because, well, they were. But that didn't mean that I never felt left out or jealous, and I knew that a bigger part of their favoring and spoiling her was because when she was five, she managed to climb up on the roof and fall, breaking her leg. It was a bad break, and they had to put in a titanium plate she'd keep until she was eight to make sure the bone healed well without permanently messing up her growth on that side. My parents blamed themselves and each other for her failing, and ever since then she'd gone from being just the baby to something more. An ongoing project to prove to themselves and each other that they wouldn't fail her again and that she'd never want for anything. Whatever that meant, in their heads or hearts, in practice, it meant she got twice as much as I ever had. And by the time she was seven, she had a toy pile in the middle of the floor that took up half her playroom. Even at eleven, I was always envious of that room and that pile, at least until the day I heard Kat's frantic cries as I was walking past the door. Turning to look into her room, I saw my little sister screaming and crying, her body buried to her waist as she scrabbled on the floor to pull herself free. My first reaction was to laugh. What, did she have a toy avalanche? That was impossible, of course. There wasn't that much stuff, and most of it wasn't heavy. I was wondering if maybe it was a weird joke, or her just playing pretend, but then her eyes found me, and my chest tightened with panic and fear. She was terrified, and she looked at me pleadingly and cried out my name. I saw her slide backwards several inches as something inside the toy pile pulled her deeper in. I ran forward tried to grab her arm. But before I could get a good grasp, she was gone. I caught a last glimpse of her before a flap of dark membranous skin pulled tight across her screaming face and tugged her downward sharply. The toy pile suddenly sunk down to half height, and as I yelled for her parents, I began kicking the pile enough to spread it around the room. There was... nothing left behind. Not Cat, not the thing that took her, nothing. We spent months looking for her, putting up posters, hosting search parties, going on local talk shows even. No one ever saw a sign of her again. Well, except for me. My parents had divorced two years before, and me and Mom were going to be moving out ourselves as soon as I finished my sophomore year of school. I was going to miss my friends. I spent even more time with them than I had when I was younger, and only partially because of being a teenager. The bigger thing was that I knew my parents blamed me for Cat disappearing. Maybe because my explanation at the time hadn't made sense to them. Everyone assumed I'd seen her abducted by some invading stranger, and I was just too scared or traumatized to tell the truth. Or maybe because they felt like once again that they'd failed their little girl, and it was easier to pin it on me than let it go. 
Either way, I only talked to Dad once a month, and I didn't see Mom much more than that outside of dinner some nights. Not that I minded much. It had happened a third of my life ago, and I had barely remembered it myself now. So when I missed a pitch from Rudy Felton that sent the baseball rolling under our house, my only thought were spiders and snakes. If I'd been by myself, I might have gone back later with a flashlight or just left the ball behind, but I didn't want to look scared in front of the other guys. I told them I'd get it, and getting down on all fours, I crab-crawled under the house and started looking for the small white glow of the ball. The light was dim under the house, but after my eyes adjusted, I could see a little ways into the murk. Muttering, I pushed deeper toward the middle of the crawl space without any sign of the baseball. I told myself I'd look for another respectable 30 seconds and then head back out if I hadn't found it by then. I was on 27 of my 30 count when I saw something against the far wall. Unlike the rest, this wall was solid brick all the way across, and it was hard to see in the shadows that it created. But still, something was catching the light over there. I couldn't say for sure if it was the baseball, but I figured I should check just in case. Pebbles and bits of concrete bit into my palms as I crawled over, my heart beating faster as I moved further out of the main avenues of light under there. It... It wasn't the baseball I was looking at, but a piece of metal. And it wasn't... Laying against the wall or stuck in the mortar between two bricks, but protruding from a large dark gray mound that bulged from the ground and halfway up the brick wall. I knew it was wrong. A bad and dangerous thing that shouldn't be there, and by extension I shouldn't be there looking at it and about to touch it. But something held me there. A dimly flickering memory in the back of my mind, not just of Kat and how I'd watched her be taken by something terrible and unknown, but an earlier memory, too. Of Kat showing me a picture of something. I remember her looking at me proudly, grinning her gap-toothed grin as she held it up to the light and pointed and said, My hand touched the metal lightly, but immediately the mound began to crumble, puffing clouds of dark dust into the air and down into my lungs. Eyes watering, I started to choke, not just from the particles I'd accidentally sucked in, but the horrible smell of it. It was a thick, rich, earthy smell that made my head swim, the scent of manure, of rot, of death, that filled me with terror and sent me scrabbling backward and out from under the house. I'd come out on the far side where I'd entered, and standing in the backyard in the afternoon sun, I was alone. Alone and shaking and crying as memories of my little sister flooded through me. And they brought her home from the hospital. The first time I held her or she took my hand. All the times we played and fought. And, and the time she broke her leg. When she got home, she showed me a copy of the x-ray my parents had gotten for her, like a trophy or a souvenir. She'd been so excited to show it to me, proudly pointing to the break, but more than that, the foreign plate of titanium they'd used to bind her leg together again. She laughed and pointed to it and said something. I said, I'm a robot now. I gave a short laugh that turned into a wretched sob. The taste of the thing breaking apart underneath the house was still coating my throat and tongue, but I barely noticed. All my attention was on that laughing memory of her, that and the cold, hard thing cutting the palm of my clenched fist. Blinking back tears, I forced myself to look down at it. I already knew. Of course I knew. I was still mostly a boy, and young enough to think that sometimes wishes are enough. I wished hard to be wrong. For it to be something else, anything else, as I opened my hand to reveal what I'd taken from the dark. A small, 
thin plate with several holes, one of them still holding a tiny screw like a loose tooth. I sucked in a breath as I turned it over. Glancing around, I bent down and threw it back under the house. That night, I told my mother we should go ahead and move. She'd found us a house already, and while I was sad to leave my school and move to the other side of the state, I was relieved when she agreed. A month later, we were living 200 miles away, and a few weeks later, they sold the house to a young couple with a pair of twins. I never told anyone about what I found, never warned anyone. I told myself no one would believe me anyway, and I'm sure that's right. Still, I was relieved when years later, Mom told me that the family we sold it to had moved away after the house burned down one night. I'm grown now, and have children of my own, but losing Cat and finding the plate years later, there's... It's not a day I don't think about it. Not just the loss and the fear, but the source of it all. Just like that little bit of metal, maybe the thing that took her is still out there, hunting and hungering, unknown, unknowable, crawling into our homes to take, to kill, to eat, and leaving nothing but scraps of pain and memory behind. Quick thing before we get into the final story of tonight. I know this won't affect everyone, but this story focuses heavily on substance abuse, specifically alcohol abuse, and there are some very extreme depictions of self-harm. If either two of these things are difficult for you to listen to or something that may trigger a response in you, feel free to sit this last one out. The timestamps will be on screen. You know how to make the pain stop, the voice hidden behind the darkness of my second floor apartment bedroom said. My last stint at rehab only kept him at bay for a day or two. Every single time I careened off the side of the wagon, he was there to catch me. He was far from my salvation, though. You know it'll make you feel so much better. (laughs) He chuckled, which seemed to cause my bedroom to vibrate ever so slightly. I pulled the pillow over my head in an attempt to shut the sound out. Unfortunately, the reverberation of his words were not bouncing off any walls, with the exception of my inner defenses that were already so weak against him. Just a taste. He whispered directly into my ear as though the flattened pillow I pressed against it wasn't even there. One drink is all it takes. He laughed softer than before, but that only made the depth of his words cut so much deeper into my brain. No! I cried out into the empty room while I pounded my fists against the soft mattress. Only the laughter echoed in response, seemingly emitting from the very oxygen I breathed. I threw the blanket off me as it was barely comforting my trembling goose flesh anyway. I pulled myself out of my bed and reached a shaky hand to the light switch next to the door. I wrapped my arms around my midsection in a feeble attempt to ease the tremors in the pit of my stomach. Every step demanded all of my effort as I made my way across the living room toward the kitchen. There you go, the voice sneered. I could almost hear the wide grin reach across his face as I began my staring contest with the half-drained bottle of Jameson that sat beside the sink. I had attempted rehab a total of three times in the past. Maybe it was my own self-hatred that led me to endure the painful process of detox over and over. Perhaps I was just to convince myself that I wasn't becoming my father. It was his voice that haunted my subconscious, though it wasn't quite him, if that makes any sense. It's both darker and at the same time friendlier than his was. It was also far more legible, as his voice in life was slurred and hard to understand most of the time. 
It almost made it easier to ignore his constant badgering and insults when I could barely make out where one word led into another. His punches were far easier to understand, though. I'm sure they didn't always land where he intended. You just gonna keep staring at it, or what? He growled into my ear. I knew I should have gotten rid of the damned bottle when I decided to forego the hospital stay this time and plow through cold turkey on my own. I think I wanted to prove I could do it, you know? Rehab would keep me clean for a while, but it never lasted. It would take less time for me to go crashing off the side of the poorly constructed wagon each time. I think I chose to keep the green bottle of liquid temptation around to prove that I could resist its allure. I was feeling pretty confident at first. I was, until the voice manifested some days ago. It was always within those first few days of sobriety he would appear. You're the same pansy you always were, the voice growled. I could vividly picture the snarled lip my father would give when he jeered at me through his gritted teeth. No, I repeated, far softer than before. I wasn't sure if I genuinely could muster the energy required to bellow out my denial, or if I just knew it would be ignored, regardless of whether I shouted or whispered. I felt my arm reach for the bottle, though it did not feel like it was my own volition. What? What are you doing? I belted out to the limb that appeared to be acting independently. I grabbed at my wrist with my other hand, the only one I still felt I had control over. No matter how hard I pulled at my right arm, it still pushed toward the half-empty bottle on the counter. No! I yelled out into the night once more as I released my grip to swap my left hand at the bottle. The glass shattered when it made contact with the microwave that was mounted above the stove. The transparent door cracked as glass met glass and the whiskey splashed back toward me from the impact. One single droplet met my lower lip and I heard the voice clawing its way forward from the recesses of my brain. More! It shouted out, causing a thin stream of blood to leak out of both of my ears and drip from my nose. I fell to my knees, barely feeling the fine slivers of the shattered whiskey bottle digging into the flesh of both kneecaps. I smelled the aroma of the spilled drink as it blended with the blood that now oozed from my legs. More. The voice echoed through my thoughts, far softer but filled with far more intent than its previous demand. I fell backward onto the cold tile floor of my kitchen and slid my body away from the pool of temptation that now blended brown with scarlet. My right arm still reached out in desperation as the demented ghost of my father screamed from within while my back slammed into the wall behind me. I wiped my mouth with the back of the only arm that still obeyed my will in a pale attempt to smear away the lingering taste a single drop had given me. The flavor threatened to send me flailing down a road I no longer wished to traverse. The addiction had taken everything away from me with the lone exception of the memory of the very man I despised it most. Lick it up, the voice murmured. It seemed more erratic all of a sudden. It's not wasted yet. It bargained, as my right arm made a desperate attempt to drag my body toward the wide pool of liquid and glass. Now! It screamed out in anguished pain. No, I said through trembling words. You can't make me. I continued shaking my head violently from side to side. Not anymore. I kept pushing my body against the wall that pressed against my back. I continued sliding my feet across the solid tiles to ensure that the lone appendage he was manipulating would not force me forward. It was long before I found my own affliction that he passed away. I won't pretend that I didn't feel a certain amount of relief and joy when I heard the news that Daddy wouldn't be coming home anymore. It was well known what a worthless piece of shit drunk he was, so my mother wouldn't face any sort of prison time when she lost her ability to handle his abuse anymore. 
There were plenty of witnesses on the night. He waged his final assault on the only woman who had ever even attempted to stand by his side. Nobody would argue that he didn't have it coming. More! The voice screamed out again as my right hand clawed at the floor, causing the fingernails on two of my fingers to tear from the flesh against where the small square tiles met. I screamed out against the pain, both physical and mental. I grabbed at my right wrist again, but the arm I could not control proved far stronger than the weakened one that still belonged to me. I dug my fingernails into the back of the hand that still waged its war to drag me toward the puddle. My actions only served to bring me more agony while the voice cackled madly behind my eyes. <laughs> You're only hurting yourself, it said with a satisfied growl. You're only hurting myself, I weakly retorted, feeling my eyes well up and my conviction fading. Let me make the pain go away, it sneered. Let Daddy make it all better. He chuckled condescendingly from within the confines of my skull. It was at that moment that I had the wild idea to pound my head against the wall that I'd been pressing my back on. I extended my neck out as far as I could without allowing my right arm to nudge me forward, and I slammed the back of my head against the wall. What the hell are you doing? The voice belted out as I beat the back of my skull against the splitting drywall again. I was already feeling dazed and dizzy, but I just kept pounding and pounding and pounding while the sheetrock flaked fine powder onto my shoulder. Stop it! He cried out in desperation as the lights finally faded away before my eyes. It was a little after my 19th birthday when the disembodied voice of my father first began to call out from the darker recesses of my mind. I had sworn to never repeat his mistakes, but I had no idea at the time that it was anything more than my own thoughts that convinced me to take that initial sip. It's not like I'd not been in the vicinity of alcohol in the years that followed his death. My mom still had the occasional drink to soothe her heavy heart, but... I never had the urge to indulge until she had made her own departure from this world. My college career started off quite well. I received a full ride due to the advances I had made in high school. Life was proving quite promising for me in the years before my mother died. It was cancer that brought her life to a close, as it had to countless others over the years. Her passing left my sister and I both stunned and broken. I still mourn for her to this day. I should not have attended that off-campus party only months after I lost her, but I sought distractions from my weary thoughts. At the time, I didn't recognize the voice that assured me that one drink wouldn't do me any harm. I only assumed it was no more than my own subconscious that recommended a little assistance in helping my broken heart to heal. It wouldn't be until many years went by after I lost my scholarship and washed out of college that I began to realize who truly whispered from the back room in my brain. I lost friends and loved ones through my inebriated and selfish actions, though I still never allowed myself to cause physical pain to anyone other than myself. That's one aspect of his that I'm grateful I never inherited. I may be a deadbeat like the man who assisted in my conception, but I'm not him. Not entirely. My head was pounding when I awoke from the unconscious state I'd forced myself into. The room spun, and it took me a few moments to register where I was and what I was doing. No! I cried out again while my right hand fed the brown-red liquid into my mouth. I coughed and spit blood across the stolen fingers and the sharpened fragments of broken bottle dug into the inner wall of my throat. Stop! I screamed while I battled to prevent the hand from reaching my mouth again, having no idea how much I'd been forced to ingest before I came back to my senses. My father laughed and yelled out in victory as he sloshed my hand into the bloody pool of whiskey and glass. Can't stop now. <laughs> he sneered and continued to chuckle. I punched at my right hand with my left, but his will seemed so much stronger than mine. I felt the fingers of my own dominant hand wrap around the thumb of my left before it was forced backwards with an almost deafening snap. I screamed out in horrified agony as the bones separated at the knuckle while the echoing 
voice of my father spilled victorious curses at me while he reached back to the puddle on the kitchen floor. I couldn't tell if my spinning head was caused by the gaping wound on the back of my skull, the shock of my broken thumb, or the onset of intoxication. As my right hand raised back toward my mouth with a fresh scoop of whiskey, blood, and glass, I darted my eyes around me in search of some manner of escaping. I finally settled my gaze on the base of the shattered bottle that lay only a foot or two away from me. I extended my leg to cup my foot around the lower half of the discarded container and dragged it across the floor toward me. While my outstretched leg guided my weapon of choice, I bit down while I pressed my hand to the floor in an attempt to bend my thumb back into a usable setting. I screamed out when the bone snapped back into a manageable state, and I grabbed the fragmented bottle case. While my father cupped my right hand around my mouth, I allowed the liquid to pour in as I jammed the jagged cylinder of glass between the bones that connected my fingers. My dad and I yelled out in unison as my metacarpals separated and snapped. No! He belted out against the stolen limb, losing partial functionality. I slammed my right hand to the ground and flipped the broken bottle around so that the thick base was now pointing downward. I dug my knee into my right forearm to restrict its movement and wrapped the fingers of my left hand around the sharpened circle of glass. Don't! My father screamed out, bringing me a wild and manic smile while I allowed the jubilation of my dad being on the defensive to overcome the intense and brutal pain that pulsed through me. I slammed the thickened base of the broken bottle onto the back of my right hand. I felt the glass cut into my fingers of my left while shattering the bones on my right. I raised it high and brought it down again and again, over and over. I beat down my own outstretched hand. Blood streamed from where I held the glass and burst from where shards of bone began to protrude through the flesh. I screamed out louder and louder with every attack against myself, while the deranged voice of my old man yelled out in protest. I'm not entirely sure when I passed out, nor whether it was from shock or exhaustion. I found myself strapped down to a hospital bed, both hands wrapped up in a certain degree of numbness. It turned out that one of the neighbors from my apartment building had called the police about a possible domestic disturbance. I must have been down for the count by the time they arrived, and I can't help but assume they found themselves perplexed by what they saw after knocking my door off its hinges. Given the degree of my apparent self-harm, I was committed to a mental institution for a time. I would go through many months of therapy, both physical and psychological. It's safe to say that my shrink didn't quite buy into my recollection of how that night's events had played out, but I think he's helped me quite a lot. Over the years that followed, I patched things up with my sister and even managed to convince a few of my old friends that I'd changed my ways. There were a few who would not buy into my claims of being a new man, but I can't blame them. Some burned bridges can never be repaired, I suppose. My right hand has never quite been the same. It turned out that I broke just about every single bone, but several surgeries and a boatload of physical therapy later, and I'm up about 70% mobility. My left sports a lot of scars and a thumb that makes a clicking noise whenever I move it, but it works just fine overall. I'm coming up on my sixth year of sobriety. I won't say it's been an easy ride, but I'm proud of the progress I've made. My sister and I are closer than ever, and I've been attending some community college classes to finally attain my engineering degree. I still hear the voice of my father from time to time. It's not as loud as it once was, but he still lingers in the darkest recesses of my mind. My shrink argues that it's just my own damaged psyche that calls out in the night, but I've seen the image of my old man just staring at me through the darkness at times. Maybe he'll always be there as a reminder of what I was. It could be that he's just waiting, just hanging in there for the possibility of a single moment. Just the smallest fragment of time to sneak back through my walls. I only hope that I have the strength to fight him off a second time.